Hey, praise the Lord. It is I, Brother Clinton, once again, and you're back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. I welcome you back to this series on 1 Peter, the book of the Bible that we call 1 Peter, which is actually an epistle or a letter that was written by Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, unto the church, the church of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. That's what the church that belongs to Jesus Christ is called, by the way, the church of Jesus Christ. Other churches that are called by other names do not belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. Just like other women out there in the street that have other names don't belong to me, they're not my wife unless she is the woman who is called by my name. And so it is that the bride of Jesus Christ is called by his name. And so those of us who belong to him, we are Christians, and we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I hope that you have begun with me at the beginning of this series. If not, I would highly recommend that you do so. All you do is just go down to where it says the word prophet right below this video. Click on that, and it'll take you to the main channel page. And then you'll see the link that is called Playlists. If you click on that, you'll see a list of all the playlists on this channel. Then scroll down to where it says First Peter and start at the beginning, and it will be a great blessing to you. I know it's been a great blessing for me, and I've heard from many of you out there that it's been a great blessing to you as well. Thank you for your patience with me as it's taken me a little while to get through what we've been through, but I also have many other things to take care of, and so I thank you for your understanding and for your prayers for me and for this ministry as well. So let's continue in First Peter, this beautiful, wonderful letter that was given to us by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, written by the hand of Peter, the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, and translated perfectly into the English language for us in this Holy Bible, King James Version. If you speak English, this is the Word of God. Other Bibles in the English language that are worded differently than this Bible are not the Word of God. They're copyrighted novels, and they cannot be the Word of God according to the Word of God because the Word of God says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And that's not possible if there's many different Bibles that are worded differently, and we believe that they're all the Word of God. It's only possible in any given language, for there to be one translation of the Bible that is God's Word. And every other translation in any given language that is worded differently cannot be God's Word. If your Bible doesn't say the same, pardon me, if your Bible doesn't say the same thing that my Bible says, then they can't both be profitable for doctrine, can they? Neither can they be profitable for reproof or correction or instruction in righteousness if they don't say the same thing. So if you speak English, the King James Version of the Holy Bible is the Word of God. So let's open our Holy Bible, King James Version, to 1 Peter chapter 1. And may God add a blessing to the reading of His Word. In the last video in this series, we ended with verse 21. So let's just jump right into verse 22. Hallelujah. Peter wrote, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Semicolon. That's not the end of the sentence. But let's stop there because there's a lot that Peter just said right here. And again, as I've said many times before, this is not theology. Okay? Theology and Christianity don't mix. Theology and the doctrine of Christ are as opposite from one another as the East is from the West. If you're studying theology... The more you study theology, the further away you will be from God and from the knowledge of the truth. Because Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But Jesus did not tell us to continue in theology. In fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the theologians in, in the day that Jesus was, was walking on the face of the earth. And all he did, it seems like, was walk around reproving them and telling them that they were fools and blind. And indeed they were, because they had replaced the word of God with the traditions of men. And how do religious leaders do that? By theology. Okay, Theology is the, is the art of changing or thinking to change the meaning of the word of God by the purposeful misuse of words and phrases in foreign languages. 
We don't do that here. We just read the Word of God as it is written. So when I say that there's a lot that Peter said right here, what I'm not saying is, let's dissect this. Let's go to the Greek and dissect it, and let's just pretend it means all kinds of other things that like we want it to mean by twisting around meanings of words in Greek so that we can make it mean whatever we want it to say. That's not what I'm saying. And those of you who know me, you know that. But maybe you're new here, and, and I welcome you here, and I just want you to know that about me and about this ministry. There's no theology here. You're not going to find theology here, because Christians have nothing to do with theology. But Peter did say quite a bit here. So he says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Purified your souls in obeying the truth. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Come with me to the 19th Psalm. Psalms chapter 19. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, the word of the Lord is pure. Hallelujah. Verse 7, Psalm 19 verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. This is the same thing that Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, is saying here and what he said actually in the next verse. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You see, if a man is born again, let's just talk about that for a moment. There are videos on this channel that are dedicated to this specific subject, but I'm going to talk about this for a moment. And those of you who are who have followed this ministry for a while, you know exactly what I'm going to say. But perhaps there's some of you who don't. And, I, and I'm thankful for that, and I welcome you here. Jesus used the phrase born again in John chapter 3, verse 3, when he said to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But many people in the churches today have the, have the, the mis- understanding or the false concept that being born again makes you a Christian. And they also have the false concept that by saying a sinner's prayer or by doing a certain thing, you can decide to become born again. And those are fallacies. Those are lies. The Bible says that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that when a man is born again, he is born again from a seed. Just like every living thing comes from a seed, whether it be plant or animal or human. Every living thing comes from a seed. And so, when we were conceived the first time, the seed that we were conceived by was a sperm from our human father. And he impregnated our mother and we were conceived in the womb and that's when we began to exist. Even though we were known of our father before the foundation of the world, we began to exist when we were conceived in our mother's womb. See, we had glory, those of us who are Christians, we had glory with our Father before the foundation of the world. Just like Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 5. But we didn't exist until we were conceived in the womb. That's when we began to exist physically. But then we were born into this world, but we were born under a curse. The curse that Adam brought upon us. And that curse was death. And so we had to be born again in order to inherit the family of God. How is a man born again? What, how, what can you do to get born again? Well, the answer is you can't do anything to get born again. You, didn't, you weren't able to do anything to get born the first time. So what makes you think you can do anything to get born the second time? You can't. The, the way that you were begotten the first time had nothing to do with you. It was a decision that was made by your father and your mother. It had nothing to do with you. You did not decide to become conceived in the womb. And so it is, as the Bible says, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And again, as it's written in John, those that are born again are born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so when a man is born again, it is because God has put his word into that man. God has sent his word unto that man, and that man has a heart that was given to him by God in order to be able to receive that word and bring forth fruit. And when that happens, that man can see the kingdom of God, and he has become born again. It's not by anything that that man decided to do, because he was walking in the darkness and didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. 
You, you see, people that are walking in the darkness, they don't know that they're in the darkness because it's dark there. You can't see the darkness when you're in the middle of it. You can only see the darkness when you've been brought forth from it. Can anybody testify and say, praise the Lord? You see, you can only see the darkness when you have been brought forth from it. And when you've been brought forth from it by the light, which is God's word, then you're born again. When you're born again, then you can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and obey it and become a Christian. And so when Peter said, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth, the same word, the same seed from whence we who are Christians were begotten is that same spiritual milk that we have need of on a daily basis to grow by. Okay? When a man is begotten in the womb of his mother by the seed that came from his father, as soon as he comes forth from the womb, what does he need? He needs milk. And where does that come from? It comes from his parents' body, from his mother's breasts. You see? So he, he came from his parents' body, and he still needs that nutrition from his parents' body. Now, in the case of a natural baby, that tends to cease after a little while, and then the child will be able to eat solid food. But for, for the sake of this parable, which is according to the word of God, when a baby comes forth from the womb, having been conceived by the seed of his father, the first thing that he needs, and that which he needs constantly, is the breast milk from his mother. Okay, And we know that he doesn't need some chemical created by a pharmaceutical company sold in a, in a grocery store that's called baby formula. He needs his mother's milk. That's what he needs. That's why God ordained that. That's why God caused her breasts to grow with milk to feed her baby. And so... So it is that when we are born of the seed of the word of God, the first thing that we need, and we need it constantly, is the, the pure milk of this word. And that's why, if we can skip ahead a little bit, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. The sincere milk of the word. Sincere is honest, genuine, pure, something that is unadulterated. And so it is that Peter said in verse 22, chapter 1, verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Now what did Jesus say in John chapter 17, verse 17, when he was praying unto his God and our God? He said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. When our Lord Jesus was praying, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see, the words that have come forth from God's mouth, otherwise called the oracles of God, they are God himself. And the Bible says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So we were raised up in a world filled with darkness. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so, and Jesus said, if the darkness, pardon me, if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? The light of the body is the eye. And if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, then thy whole body is full of darkness. And if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness, saith the Lord. And that's how we were when we were unregenerate, when we were living in the world, probably going to church for years and years, unregenerate not born of God, not having obeyed the gospel of Christ, just going to church and thinking that going to church was pleasing to God. You know, we wore a cross around our neck and we went to church and we thought that God was happy with that because we had never read his word. We didn't have his word in us. We didn't even know what his word said. But now, those of us who have been redeemed, those of us who are in Christ Jesus, who have obeyed his gospel, baptized in his name and filled with his spirit, with the manifest sign of speaking with other tongues and prophesying as the scripture says, now we are in him and he is in us. And we are born of his word. That's how we came to be sons of God. You see, we got born of his word. He put his word in us and we received it into our hearts and began to see light. And as we began to see light, he drew us out of the darkness. And then he gave us the way of salvation that he gave to his apostles. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
And the one who spoke those words by the Holy Ghost on the day that the New Testament began, on the day of Pentecost, is the very same one who wrote this letter that we have the blessed opportunity to read right now. So if you'll come with me to John, chapter 15. Come with me to John, the Gospel according to John, chapter 15. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's just start from the beginning. I want to read a few verses of, of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this is not theology. This is not something that we're just supposed to memorize. Let's pay attention, because these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. A husbandman is someone who owns a, a vineyard. He's the landowner. And, pardon me, and every branch in me, pardon me, a husbandman is a landowner, but more properly, a husband is someone who works the land. Let me put it that way. A husbandman is someone who works the land. Someone might call him a gardener, but a gardener is like a hired servant. A husbandman is someone who has land and works that land. So he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. This is something that should cause us to sit back a little bit and think and examine ourselves. Am I bringing forth fruit? If I'm not bringing forth fruit, what can I do to be more diligent so that God will bring forth fruit through me? Because if I don't bring forth any fruit, well, let's just continue reading. He said, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. But let's continue a little bit. He said, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of, of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. This is what happens if someone does not abide in Jesus Christ. Now how long does it take of not abiding in Jesus Christ until this will happen? I don't know. I can't tell you that. But you see, just knowing that should be enough to cause you to say, if I haven't been abiding in Jesus Christ, it's time for me right now to go back to the narrow way and start abiding in Jesus Christ and start doing what he has called me to do. Praise the Lord. And if you're able to do that, then then he's willing to receive you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But let's go back to verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Why did Jesus our Lord say this? Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Because he said in a different place, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus confessed several times that the words that he spoke were not his own. They were the words of God. And verily so, because... God said to Moses, I will raise them up a prophet. I'm quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. God said to Moses, I will raise them up a prophet like unto thee from among thy brethren. And it shall come to pass that I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto the people all that I command him. And whosoever shall not hearken unto the words that I shall command him, I will require it of them. Jesus was that prophet. He spoke the word of his father. The words that he spoke were the words of God, his father, his God and his father, my God and my father, hopefully your God and your father too. Praise the Lord. You see, the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God didn't become flesh. The word of God is spirit and life. The word of God cannot become flesh. The word of God cannot become something that it isn't. The Word of God isn't flesh, and it can't become flesh. But the Word of God was made flesh. What's the difference, Brother Clinton? The Word of God was in a man, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in a way very similar to the fact that the Word of God is in me. And if you're a Christian, the Word of God is in you, except the difference is that I'm not the only begotten Son of God, and neither are you. We were born from Adam. Jesus Christ our Lord was not. His father wasn't Adam. And so there was no sin in his blood. There was no sin in him, and he did no sin. And therefore he is the Christ, the anointed of God. But the word of God was in him, 
This is why the Bible says that his name was called the Word of God, because the Word of God is in him. The Word of God isn't a man. If you think that the Word of God is a man, then you're very confused. And that's just a ridiculous thing to believe, because the Word of God is not a man. The Word of God is spirit and in life. Pardon me, spirit and life. And so Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. And he said in John 17, pardon me, John 15, 3, now ye are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. How can we be clean by a word that someone speaks to us? Because that word is God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The words that God spoke those words are God. The words that we read from the pages of this Bible, these words are God. When we open up this Bible and begin to read it, we are in the presence of God. You don't have to put on your mountain boots and go climbing up a mountain to get in the presence of God. All you have to do is find an, a place where you can get by yourself and open this Bible and read it. <coughs> Pardon me. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Remember what Paul also said, testifying of the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Pardon me, chapter 5, verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, his bride, with the washing of water by the word. Let's read. 25 and 26 to get a little better context. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The word of God isn't water. But Jesus is washing his bride with his word in the same way that someone would wash a dinner plate with water. After you're done eating dinner, and there's lots of food residue on your dinner plate, you take it to the sink, hopefully you do, <laughs> and you wash it with water. And the water coming out of the faucet or wherever it comes from washes the, the residue and the, and the dirty things off of the plate so that it can be ready to be used again, so that it's clean, so it doesn't have any used food on it because nobody would want to you know, have dinner on a plate with used food on it. I know I wouldn't. And so Jesus desires a church that is sanctified. And for that reason, he is washing us with water by his word. This is why Jesus said, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Now this is going to take a few minutes for us to talk about, so make yourselves comfortable. Seeing you have purified your souls. Did you know that you don't have a soul? Did you know that? You don't have a soul. A soul is not something that you have. It is what you are. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living soul. So you see, a soul is not something that you have. It's something that you are. You are a soul. You have spirit, and you live in a body. This is what the scripture teaches. You are a soul. You have spirit. The word spirit is a word that refers to the life that is in something. Okay. For those of you who know Hebrew, you know that it's the word ruach, which is translated spirit many times in the Old Testament, is translated spirit, and it's also translated breath. The breath that is in you. Okay. And I'm not using theology, and I'm not trying to mix you all up. I'm just saying that this, the spirit of someone is the breath that is in someone. It's the life that is in you. The body without the spirit is dead. All right? When somebody passes away, they give up the ghost, as the Bible says, they give up the ghost, then their body is just a body. It's not that person anymore. It's just a body. 
Okay, that's why I've said for you know for years, when, whenever I die, you can do whatever you want with my body. I don't care what you do with it. You can dump it in the ocean, you can chop it up and you know feed it to the fish or whatever. Um, you can shoot it out of a cannon. You can chop it in half and shoot it out of two cannons. You can even shoot the two halves out of both cannons right directly at each other if you want to and see if you can cause them to hit in midair or whatever. I don't care. It makes no difference because I'll be done with it until the time comes that the Lord, our God, will cause me to be resurrected and I will be in, in a new body. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This body will be resurrected and made new. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But the Bible says, seeing you have purified your souls. Okay, your soul isn't something that you have. It is what you are. And when the word of God comes to your soul, and there's a, there's a video on this channel that is called The Parable of the Sower Explained. And I highly recommend that you would look that up because it's a, it's a great blessing. It's something that was shown me many years ago by means of uh, an elder brother. And, uh, but it was by the Spirit of God. And it's, it's, very, it's a great blessing to give the understanding of exactly how the Word of God works in, a, in the soul of a man in order to cause him to become born again. Uh, because there's, you know, the Word of God comes forth, and we can see that as the Word of God came forth in the midst of the people of Israel, uh, the sower soweth the seed, as the Lord said, and some fell by the wayside, and some fell among thorns, and some fell among stony, stony ground, and others fell on good ground and brought forth fruit. And so the same Word went forth, but there were different kinds of souls that were in its path. And Sometimes the people were very glad to hear the word of God up to a certain point because they were very glad when Jesus said that their sins were forgiven or when they were healed from their infirmities or when they had something to eat. But when Jesus began to speak the true word of God, not that he wasn't speaking it before, but when Jesus got into more profundity of the word of God and began to speak about the kingdom of God, then the people said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And they all left except for the twelve. And when he said to the twelve, Will ye also go away? They said unto him, Lord, where shall we go? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. See, they knew where the life was. It's in God's word. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word of God is God himself, and God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And when you're receiving the word of God, you're filling yourself with light. And as you fill yourself with light, the darkness has to flee. Does that make sense? It should. That's called sanctification. When you fill yourself with light and the darkness has to leave, that's called sanctification. This is why Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, There's lots of people in the churches today who can quote the phrase, the truth shall make you free. Actually, they, most of them misquote it. They say, the, the, truth will set, the truth will set you free. And that's, I won't say that that's wrong. It's just not exactly the way it's written in the Bible. But the, you know, the truth will set you free. The truth will make you free. People will quote that all over the place. But if you ask them where that's written in the Bible, they won't know. And if you ask them what the full sentence is in which that phrase was used by our Lord Jesus... They won't know. 99% of them won't know. And I'm not saying that to slander anybody. I'm saying it as a matter of fact. But those of you who follow this ministry know, because I say this all the time, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So Jesus said, if ye continue in my word. He didn't say, if you go to church every Sunday and Wednesday. He didn't say, if you go to seminary. He didn't say, if you learn theology. He didn't say, if you learn Greek and Hebrew. He said, if ye continue in my word. If ye continue in my word. Now this means at least a couple of things. Number one, it means that we read God's word. And number two, it means we do what God says. Because if we read God's word and don't do what he says, then how are we his disciples? Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. 
He didn't just say, if you read my word, you are my disciples indeed. He said, if you continue in my word. And in another place, he said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke chapter 6, verse 46, read it for yourself. And so, to continue in the word of God means to not only read God's word, but to believe it and do it. When God's word says that we should do something, then we do that if we are his disciples. We don't tell God, well, you know, I, I got to be real and I live in, in a real world, so, you know, I can't really do that. But I've got it memorized. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I don't recommend Francis Chan as, as a teacher of the Word of God. I'm not speaking against him, but he, he's not quite in the faith of Jesus Christ. At least he wasn't the last time I heard from him. But I remember he told the story about his daughter. His daughter's name was Rachel. He calls her Rach. And uh, he said uh, he was teaching. And he, he was teaching in, in, a, in a church meeting. And he, he was using this example. And he says, you know, I said one day to my daughter, Rach, go clean your room. And he said, my daughter, Rachel, she knows better than to come downstairs two hours later and said, Hey, Dad, I memorized what you said. <laughs> I can say it in Greek. <laughs> that's, that's not what he meant when he said, Rach, go clean your room. What he meant was, go clean your room. But, you know, she's, she's not going to come downstairs two hours later and say, I memorized what you said, and later on, I'm going to have some friends come over, and, and we're going to have a discussion about what it would look like if I clean my room. <laughs> and I mention that because that's what most people that profess to be Christians do. You know, they're very good at memorizing God's word, just like their fathers, the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're, they're very good at memorizing God's word, but they're not so good at doing what it says. And it's, it's not that they're not good at it like they, like, but as if they lacked the talent to do so. What they lack is the desire to do so because their hearts are hardened against God and they don't love him. And the first and greatest commandment is that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. So this obviously means that if we do that, then when God says for us to do something, we say, yes, sir, and we do it. And we do it joyfully, just like a good godly wife does for her husband. Because we are the bride of Christ. And so if we abide in God's word, if we abide in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, if we continue in his words, then are we his, his disciples indeed. And we shall know the truth, and the truth shall make us free. Well, how does knowing the truth make you free? Because the truth is light, and it makes you free from the darkness so that you can live in holiness. Holiness doesn't come from a set of rules nailed to the wall at your church where you go. Holiness doesn't come from the, 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 doctrinal, the doctrinal statement or the statement of faith from your denomination. Holiness doesn't come from the list of rules that your pastor made up of things that you're allowed to do and are not allowed to do. Holiness comes from the inside. You see, religious rules come from the outside in, but holiness comes from the inside out. And it comes from having the light in you. You know, you might go to a Pentecostal church and you might say, well, we don't, we don't go swimming because our pastor said we don't go swimming. That's all you know. You don't have any idea why it would be wrong for you to strip down to a little outfit the same size as your underwear except a different color and, you know, go running around in the midst of other people, men and women, in a bathing suit. It's, the reason it's called a bathing suit is because it's for bathing. Okay? <laughs> it's not for getting together with others in public. And so, you know, the, the reason that you wouldn't want to go swimming, as, they, as some say, um, you know, with men with women, that, you know, the, how should I say this? The only time that a man and a woman should be swimming together is if they're married to each other. But, you know, when you're with other people that are not your husband or your wife and you're, you know, you're basically naked, um, that's not something that you should be doing. And it's not just something that you shouldn't be doing because your pastor said so. It's something that you shouldn't want to do because of the Holy Ghost inside of you, because of the Word of God inside of you, which will let you know, ah, I don't know, I don't think that would be prudent. I wouldn't want to do that. It's not that it's a, it's a thing that you have to give up because of your church. It's a thing that you wouldn't want to do anymore because the light is in you. 
So you don't want to smoke a cigarette. You don't want to have a beer. You don't want to sit in front of a football game or a basketball game or whatever. You don't want to laugh at somebody's dirty jokes uh, where they degrade people and have, you know, different, you know, sarcastic words for people of different skin colors and, you know, speak evil of and, and degrade women and things like that. You, you don't want to hear things like that anymore. You just want to say, oh, well, guess what? I'm not the garbage can. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the garbage can's over there, so you might want to go over and have your conversation with it, but I'm out of here. And I know that we wouldn't be that, that, that um, <laughs> brash with someone, but that's just an example to kind of make you smile, to give you the idea of what I'm talking about. Holiness comes from the inside. It comes from having the Word of God in you. So that it's not some, a set of rules that you have to just you know, give up this and that because that's the rules. It's that you wouldn't want to do those things anymore anyway. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Let's remember that James said, and it's, it's right before Peter if you want to look at it, James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now let's look at that for a minute. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Did you know that you can deceive your own self? It's very easy to deceive your own self. All you have to do to deceive your own self, I'll give you an example, is read the Word of God and then don't do what it says. Read the Word of God and decide that you don't want to do what it says, so you go to a theological commentary and allow some theologian to enable you to explain it away so that you don't have to do it anymore. There's people that, that you know, get caught up in that about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, they write to me all the time, probably once a day. Somebody will write to me or comment on this channel and tell me that they don't need to be baptized to be saved. What a ridiculous statement. What an absolutely perfectly ridiculous statement. Not only is it ridiculous for them to say that, professing to be Christians, but to post a comment like that on a Christian video where in, in which I have preached from the Word of God that baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is for the remission of sins and that it saves us and that it is how we are washed from our sins. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. As the Lord said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. That that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, beginning at Jerusalem. So the Bible teaches over and 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 over that baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, since the day that the New Testament began, is for the remission of sins, and it saves us, and it's how our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. But yet, there are many people who will write to me professing to be Christians and want to argue with me and tell me that we don't have to be baptized in order to be saved from our sins. Why do they do that? Why do they think that? Because they read the Word of God, but they don't want to believe and obey the Word of God. You see, they want to obey whatever their religious denomination likes because that's where they feel most comfortable. So they deny the Word of God and they go to their religious leaders to ask them to explain away certain verses of the Scripture. They go to their pastor or their religious leader and they say, Pastor, Pastor so-and-so, Pastor Brown, somebody said to me that Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. How do I deal with that? How do I argue against that? And then their pastor will sit down with them in their office and open up their theological commentaries and say this and that and the other thing and fill them full of nonsense and you know, use the Greek language, or I should say misuse the Greek language to cause them to think that the Bible says something that it doesn't really say. And then they'll walk away like, oh, thank you, Pastor, I can win this argument now. Fools and blind they are. Fools and blind. If only they would spend their, the, all that time and energy reading the Word of God and doing what it says instead of learning how to argue against it, which will profit them nothing. You know, I look forward to seeing them try to have that argument with the Lord Jesus Christ on the Day of Judgment. Oh no, but if you break it down in the Greek, Jesus! 
Bye. Right? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is for the remission of sins. And and just in, in, in many different matters, people will write to me and they will they profess to be Christians and they will argue against the word of God. Why is it that they can't see the truth? Because they have deceived their own selves. They have deceived their own selves because they decided not to believe the word of God and rather to seek out the serpent's agents to help them to explain it away so that they don't have to believe it as it is written. And in their minds, if they don't have to believe it as it is written, then they don't have to do it. And so there's people that will write to me saying, you're, you're a legalist. You're saying that we have to obey the law to be saved because I preach what the word of God says, be holy for I am holy. If you love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Those are Jesus' words. I didn't make them up. So if you don't keep the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ, you don't love him. And if you're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, then you don't have God. That's what the Bible says. But people will come to me and say, you're a legalist. We don't have to repent from our sins or anything. All we have to do is just believe that Jesus is risen from the dead and we're saved and we have the Holy Spirit and we're sealed and all that foolishness and nonsense. Why are they so deceived? Why is it that they can't see that the Word of God clearly says that they are in error? Because they have decided to deceive their own selves. They have decided to deceive their own selves. Do you know that God will give you whatever you want? If you want deception, God will give you deception. He's, he'll be like, all right, buddy, there you go. There you go. And God isn't giving them deception. God has just told them in his word that if they will read his word and not obey it, then they will bring deception upon their own selves. And so they do. So they do. And they go to the serpent's theologians and they learn how to explain away the word of God and how to appease their consciences with their, the lies that they've learned from their, from their seminarian theologians who were raised up by Jesuits, who came from the serpent. And they're content in their lies. And there are many of them who have been doing that for decades. Decades. There's a man that I know of. His name is Kevin Zuber. And there's a video on this channel that's been there for years that I made for Kevin Zuber. He is a very uh, renowned theologian. And when I was in prison back in 1997, I believe it was, he used to come in as a volunteer at Phoenix FCI. FCI is the Federal Correctional Institution. He used to come in every Monday night and preach. And I was very young, just a young babe in Christ. And, um, and I used to go and listen to him until I heard him say some things that were just basically mocking the Holy Ghost and mocking people that believe the gospel of Christ. And that's when I decided to stop attending his meetings. But... Um, you know, he, he's a very confused man who has been for decades, still to this day, as far as I know, um, preaching lies and, and just ridiculous lies that, that totally and blatantly in broad daylight contradict the Holy Scriptures. And yet he's believed for decades that he is a Christian and he's never obeyed the gospel of Christ. He doesn't even know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. In fact, he doesn't even know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He thinks that Jesus Christ is a part of a trinity of co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent gods. He's a very smart man. But the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And he has chosen to disregard the word of God and to use the witchcraft of theology to convince himself otherwise than what the word of God says. And so... He has brought deception upon him, his own self. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So Peter said, seeing ye have purified your souls. Seeing ye, Peter wrote this to the church. I'm back in 1 Peter 1.22, by the way. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. When the light comes to you, you have a choice to make. If you obey, then you will have more light. Even as it is written, light is sown for the righteous. Light is not sown for the sinners. Light is sown for the righteous. When you are given light and you embrace the light and you obey what is written, then God will give you more light. But you can obey the light and obey the light and obey the light and then all of a sudden at whatever point you decide to veer, pardon me, to veer away from the light, if you veer away from the light, where are you going? Into the darkness. 
That's where you're going. And so there's, there's all these denominations. You know, Baptist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, um, Church of God in Christ, uh, Churches of Christ, uh, Catholic, Mormon, Jehovah's Witnesses. All You know, there's hundreds of them. And they all started with good intentions, believing the Word of God. But then each one of them came to a certain point, and it was a different point for each one of them, that they decided that they didn't want to do things the way God said in His Word. They fell victim to the lies of a theologian who told them, who convinced them that God's word doesn't really mean what it says. And they decided to veer off of the narrow path into the darkness. And so because they were no longer abiding in the doctrine of Christ, they could not be called Christians. And so they had to make up another name for themselves, like Baptists or Lutherans or Methodists or Episcopalians or Apostolics or Pentecostals or Catholics or you know whatever the case may be. Why do these people have to make up a name for what they are? Because they don't belong to Jesus Christ. If they belonged to Jesus Christ, they would be called by his name, just like I told you in the beginning of this video and like I've told you many times. You know, if there's some woman named Maria Lopez and she's running around the street saying, I'm Brother Clinton's wife, I'm Brother Clinton's wife. Well, good for her and all that, but she can't come in my house because she's not called by my name. She can't come in my house and kiss me and open my refrigerator and sleep in my bed because she doesn't have my name. I don't know her. My wife is called by my name. She has a key to my house. She comes in and out as she pleases. She opens the refrigerator as she pleases. She sleeps in my bed. She, because she's my wife. She's mine. She's called by my name. She's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. If she wasn't called by my name, she wouldn't be mine. And so it is that those organizations of people that are called by other names than the Lord Jesus Christ are not his. Period. I don't care how zealous they seem to be or how religious you think they are or how much you think they love God. If they have denominated themselves, then they have rejected the name of the living God and called themselves by another name, and they're not his bride. Period. That's it. End of story. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, when the light comes to you and you will obey that which is contained in the light, then it will purify your soul. It will purify you. This is, again, why Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth, Father, for thy word is truth. This word, the words that are written on the pages of this Bible, not this book, this book is paper. The words that are written in this book they are the words of the living God, given by inspiration of God, and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Brother Clinton, what, why do I need righteousness? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the kingdom of God is for the righteous. It's not for sinners. If you're a sinner, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I've said this many times. Those of you who know me, you're like, oh, Brother Clinton, again with that? Yes, yes, again with that. If you're a sinner, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. And there are many people out there who have been taught in their churches that they are a sinner saved by grace. Well, if you used to be a sinner and you've been saved by the grace of God, praise the Lord. But if you've been saved, you're not a sinner. How can you be a sinner if you've been saved? If you say that you're a sinner but you've been saved, what exactly have you been saved from if you're still a sinner? <laughs> if you're still a sinner, then you haven't been saved from your sins. If you had been saved from your sins, you would no longer be a sinner. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, when you hear the truth and you receive it in an honest and good heart, as the Lord Jesus said in the parable of the sower, if you receive the word in an honest and good heart, that means 
that whatever the Lord says, you say, yes, sir, and you do it. You don't say to him, well, I'll take that under advisement. And if I think that it's good for me to do so, then I'll do that. And if I don't think it's good for me to do, then I'll just make up an excuse and I won't do that. That's like the man that built his house upon the sand. And yea, he had a house, but it was built on the sand. And then the floods came and the winds blew and the rains came and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Just like the old saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Hey, you might have built yourself a big old mansion on the sand. What's going to happen when the rains come and the wind and the floods beat upon that house? It's going to fall. And that big old mansion will fall much harder than a little teeny shack. But if you build your house upon the rock, then when the rains come and the winds blow, and the floods beat upon that house, it will not fall because it is founded upon a rock. And that rock is our Lord Jesus Christ. And don't tell me that Jesus Christ is your rock if you're not obeying what he says because you're lying. Don't tell me that Jesus Christ is the rock of your salvation if you know that you're a sinner, if you still call yourself a sinner, if you can't go 24 hours without sinning against God, then you're a sinner. And if you're a sinner, then you haven't been saved from your sins. Because if you had been saved from your sins, you wouldn't be a sinner anymore. If you were in prison, and somebody came and bailed you out of prison, then you would have been saved from prison. Because you're not in prison anymore. If you're still in prison, then you can't rightly say that somebody has saved you from prison because you're still in prison. That just wouldn't make any sense, would it? <laughs> and the Bible says that he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. So if you're still in prison to sin, you're still a servant to sin. You can't stop yourself from sinning. You sin every day. Then you're not saved from anything. But if we will hear the truth and obey it, then we will not deceive our own selves, but we will receive more light. Light is sown for the righteous. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. See, it's not about just knowing the truth. It's about obeying the truth. Knowing the truth will avail you nothing if you do not obey it. In fact, according to the scripture, knowing the truth and not obeying it is worse than never having known the truth at all. And if we have the opportunity as we go through 1 Peter and 2 Peter, we'll be able to, um, we'll be able to see where Peter wrote about just that. That it's better for them not to have known the way of truth than after that they have known it to turn from the holy commandment which was given unto them. And it was written of them according to that true proverb, the dog turneth again to his own vomit and the fool to his folly. So, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Okay, I think we've got the point now. I've been speaking for almost an hour about this, this one part of the sentence. But God had put it in my heart to do so. Again, you know, when I talked to the Lord earlier before making this video about these four verses of the scripture, and I had no idea what I was going to say, and I even began to sit here for a little bit in my chair and meditate on it before I turned on the camera, and the Lord showed me that I didn't need to do that. And I didn't know what I was going to talk about. I mean, I had a couple of ideas, of course. I've read this many times, but, um, you know, I thought I was going to be done in 10 minutes. But obviously not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So... And I hope you're getting blessed by this too, because I am as well, because he that watereth shall be watered also himself, as the scripture saith. So, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. This is what Peter is saying. Okay, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Through the Spirit. Okay, now, there are some of us who are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, some of us watching this video, who are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and have not yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I testify unto you that if you believe the Word of God, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible says, repent 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But now what I'm going to say to you, I want you to listen very carefully because I don't want anybody to get confused. To be born of water and of the Spirit is to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, it will be manifested by a sign from heaven, which is that you will speak in another tongue, another language that you have not previously learned. And you will be prophesying, magnifying God, prophesying because God is going to be the one speaking through you and you won't know what you're saying. And that's exactly as God has ordained it to be. However, if you have not received the Holy Ghost yet, but you have the Word of God in you, what is the Word of God? It is Spirit and it is life. Now, I'm not saying that if you have the Word of God in you that you have received the Holy Ghost. But what I'm saying is that the Word of God is that Spirit. The Word of God is that Spirit. The Word of God is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God was that Word. The words that came forth from God is God himself. Is, I should have said, are. The words that came forth from God are God himself. And so, through the Spirit, when Peter said through the Spirit, he was obviously speaking about those of us who are in Christ and Christ in us. We have the Holy Ghost. But for those of you who haven't received the Holy Ghost yet, I don't want you to get discouraged Although you do, you do need the Holy Ghost in order to enter into the kingdom of God and to be in covenant with the Lord to have the circumcision of Christ. And God will fulfill that if you believe his word. However, even if you haven't received the Holy Ghost yet, this doesn't exclude you. Because if you have believed on the Lord and been baptized in his name, then you have obeyed the gospel of Christ and you're waiting for the promise of the Father. And so it is through the Spirit that we obey the truth. It is through the Spirit that we obey the truth. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. So when you have the Holy Ghost in you, he will lead you into all truth. When you have the Holy Ghost in you, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory, then you have the sinless one in you who will lead you to live in righteousness and holiness. The Spirit of Christ, if he is in you, is not going to lead you to do things that are contrary to his word. The Spirit of Christ, if he is in you, is not going to lead you to go to a seminary. The Spirit of Christ, if he is in you, is not going to lead you to go to a Baptist church or a Lutheran church or a Catholic church and bow down before devils. The Holy Spirit, if he is in you, is not going to lead you to go out and find a prostitute or to do a bong hit, or to drink a beer, or to smoke a cigarette, or to sit down in front of a football game, or a Hollywood movie. You see, the Spirit of Christ, if he is in you, is not going to lead you to do those things. And the Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The sons of God are the ones that are led by the Spirit of God. The Pharisees said to Jesus, we be not born of fornication, God is our father. And he said, if God were your father, you would love me. And then they said, well, Abraham is our father. And he said, if Abraham were your father, then you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who had told you the truth that I heard from God. This did not Abraham. So according to the Bible, whoever is our father is the one that, that our works identify with, if I may say it that way. The sons of God are the ones that are led by the Spirit of God. Jesus said, I do the works of my Father. That bears witness to the fact that he is the Son of God. Not just physically, but spiritually, really. Okay, I, by the grace of God, am a son of God. Naturally, I am the son of a man named David. But I didn't do according to his works. He died lost, unfortunately. In 2011, February 9th, 2011, he went to hell. That was his choice. I don't feel sorry for him. It doesn't make me happy, but I don't feel sorry for him either because he chose that. So he's my father, naturally speaking. He begat me naturally, but he's not my father. My father is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the Almighty God. And I do after his works. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying that's, that's the fact. That's how it works. As John said, he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He, Jesus Christ. He that doeth righteousness, a man that doeth righteousness, is righteous, even as he, Jesus Christ, is righteous. If you're begotten of God, <clears throat> then you will do the works of God. But if you're a child of the devil, then you'll do the works of the devil. The Bible testifies of this. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. But Jesus Christ came into the world to destroy the works of the devil, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If the Spirit of Christ be in you, then you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if you're in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, then you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And if because the Spirit of Christ in you, pardon me, and if because the Spirit of Christ is in you, you do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, then what are you? You're a saint. That's what the Bible calls a saint, a Christian. Baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ and filled with his Spirit, being led of his Spirit, walking in his ways. You don't just abstain from sin because it's part of a list of things not to do that your pastor wrote down and stuck on the wall. You abstain from sin because the, the one who gave his life for you and is risen from the dead and who gave the law in the first place is in you, leading you. If the Holy Ghost is in you, then the things that you're going to do are holy. And if your life isn't holy, then it's not the Holy Ghost who's leading you. It just makes perfect sense. A child could understand that. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Paul wrote in another place, now the end of the commandment is this. Um, now the end of the commandment is this. Love unfeigned and faith unfeigned and charity out of a pure heart. I think it's the other way around. Charity out of a pure heart and love unfeigned and faith unfeigned. Okay, that's the end of the commandment. The end of the commandment. The end of the commandment means that's what the, the law was intended to put in us. If we keep the commandments of God, the result of us keeping the commandments of God is charity out of a pure heart and of love unfeigned. No, pardon me. It's of a good conscience. Pardon me. I'm misquoting the scripture. Let me just go there. It's in 1 Timothy, and I'm not sure what verse. Now, the end of the commandment. It's in 1 Timothy 1.5. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Oh, it is what I said. Pardon me. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. That's what it is. I wasn't quoting it correctly. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Charity out of a pure heart. When you, when you obey the truth, when you obey the truth, you get light. Because the truth is light. And if you obey the truth, then you get more light, more truth. And the truth will make you free from the power of darkness so that you're abiding in the light. And when you're abiding in the light, you have love for your brethren. Even as it's written in 1 John, he that loveth him that begat, loveth also him that is begotten of him. It's written in 1 John chapter 5. Um, it's in the first verse. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So when we love God and we keep his commandments, we are loving our brethren because loving our brethren is one of his commandments. In fact, it is the great commandment that Jesus Christ gave to his apostles, saying that a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. So when we obey the truth, then we have love for the brethren. Whosoever hateth his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and a murderer hath no eternal life abiding in him. 
You see, a murderer is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. If you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of the judgment. We are to love our brethren. And again, that's not just something that we do grudgingly because it's something that we it's it's a rule that we have to keep. It's something that comes forth from us when we obey the light, when we come into the light, when we're brought out of the darkness into the light, and then we love the light, receive it into a good and honest heart, and obey the light, then we're given more light because light is sown for the righteous. And what is the result of that? Part of the result of that is unfeigned love of the brethren. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Jesus said that this is the mark. He said, by this shall they know that ye are mine. By this shall they know that you belong to me. When you have love one for another. Now what do we see in the religious arena? You can see it on YouTube all the time if you're on YouTube all the time, which you shouldn't be. <laughs> But you can see people, I mean, look at the comment section on just about any video on this channel. And you'll, you, you won't have to look very far to find somebody that professes to be a Christian who came to this ministry only to take to their keyboard and write some scathing comment in hatred. And those people profess to be Christians. And they will write scathing things like, you're such an idiot, you're a moron, you're a fool, you don't know anything, you're, you're a heretic, you're a false prophet, this and that. And they won't explain what they're talking about. And they won't come to you and say, you know, excuse me, brother. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I don't know you very well, but I heard you say this. But I understand that the Bible says this. Can you explain to me why you said that? Or perhaps they might, if they feel I've erred, they might say, well, you said this, but the Bible actually says this. But they won't do that. They'll come and they'll say, you're a heretic. You're a false prophet. And they come with hatred and venom and spite, and reviling. And yet, they think that they're Christians. They're convinced that they're Christians. But they walk in hatred. And the, and the Bible says, Whoso hateth his brother walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth. This is why Jesus wasn't afraid to go back to, to Jewry. Because he said, are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he has the light of this world, and he stumbleth not. But he knew that the people that hated him couldn't see where they were going. So how should you be afraid of walking in the midst of a bunch of people that can't even see where they're going? <laughs> Praise the Lord. See, our Lord Jesus, he understood these things. He knew these things, and he taught us these things. So unfeigned love of the brethren is something that is that, that will be in us, that will be present in us when we come into the light and we obey the light. And we walk in the light. When we walk in the light, John said that. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have what? We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we walk in the light as he, Jesus Christ, is in the light, because he is the one that dwelleth in the light that, that no man can even approach unto, the one who no man hath seen nor can see. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. Fellowship. We are fellows. We are brethren and sisters. We're begotten from the same word. We're filled with the same spirit. We're baptized in the same name. We've been bought by the same blood. We're heirs to the same kingdom. We've been adopted into the same family. We have different mothers, but the same father. And so we have fellowship if we walk in the light. Walk in the light. The words that are in this book, they are the light. If you continue in my word, 
Then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free from the power of darkness, because he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. But God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. We don't have any fellowship with God if we walk in the darkness. How do you have fellowship with God if you walk in the darkness? God doesn't have fellowship with the darkness. God Almighty is light. He does not have fellowship with the darkness. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Well, brother, wait a second. I thought I was cleansed from all sin when I was baptized in his name. No, you weren't. You were cleansed from your past sins when you were baptized in his name. The way that you are cleansed from all sin is when you walk in the light. After, after, after having been baptized in his name, you walk in the light. If you're not walking in the light, if you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you were saved from your past sins. That was to remit your sins. Not past, present, and future like the lying preachers of, of, of the modern age will say, but for the remission of the sins that are past, as the Apostle of Christ wrote in the book of Romans. I forget the verse. It's in chapter 3, 23, 25, somewhere in there. For the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. If you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, it was for the remission of your sins. But if you continue in your sin, then you're not saved from your sins. You've been saved from your sins in time past, but if you go back to your sins and live in your sins, how are you saved from them? You're not. You're a sinner. And you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God if you're a sinner. So you don't understand. The kingdom of God is holy. It is a refuge that God hath prepared for them that love him. It is not a place for sinners. Sinners have no place there. And in fact, if you're a sinner, not only would, would you, will you not be allowed to enter in, but even if you were allowed to enter in, you wouldn't be able to stand being there. And the first thing that you would do is look for the door. Even as Peter, when he was still a sinner, bowed down at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ and said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, not feignedly, fervently, fervently. What does it mean to love one another? It means to esteem other better than ourselves. It means to be about helping others and, and, and helping them to get the things that they need more than we're more time than we're spending trying to get the things that we need because if i try to get the things that i need then i'm too busy to help you and i might get the things that i need but then those things might be taken right from my hand because it is written seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you but if i commit my life to serving the lord jesus christ which means also to serve you my brother or my sister then while i'm busy serving you the things that i need are going to be handed to me from god <laughs> literally okay and i'm not speaking parables and i'm not speaking something i don't know about because i've been living for the last seven years here in costa rica without a job okay my job is to serve the lord jesus christ and i don't do that for money i do that because i'm his and i serve you and he provides for me the things that i have need of i haven't worked at a secular job in seven years this is my work this is what i do and I don't do this to make a living. I do this because this is what I'm called to do. And as I serve God and serve you, then he provides for me. And as you serve God and serve others, then God will provide for you. You see, it's the exact opposite of the ways of this world. It's the kingdom of God. And so when we love one another with a pure heart fervently, we're fulfilling the law of Christ. And if you do that, you see, you don't have to worry about what you're going to wear. You don't have to worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow. You don't have to worry about how you're going to pay your rent. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a job and be responsible. Of course you should. Because if you just, just decide not to work and not be responsible, then you'll wind up living outside. Okay, because you have to be responsible and you have to earn a living and, and you know, pay your rent. 
or your, you know, pay for your house, whatever, whatever, however it is that you pay for your house so that you can have a house and food, especially if you have a family. So yes, of course, the Bible says that if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. So yes, it's good and right and necessary to be responsible and to work. However, at the same time, it's not for us to spend all of our time trying to figure out how to get the things that we need. But if we spend our time serving God and serving each other in love, loving one another, if I spend my time, say, say your car's broken down and I know how to work on cars. I don't really, but just an example. Um, you know, it, it, I know how to change out a battery, okay, and a spark plug. If you know, Spark plugs aren't even, I don't know if you can even change a spark plug anymore. But anyway, I love you, Brother Matthew. You can probably correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I don't even know if you can change a spark plug anymore. Our Brother Matthew's a mechanic. But anyway, if, if your car's broken down and I know how to work on cars, okay, I'm going to come over to your house if I can, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you fix your car. But what if I was already planning on doing something that day for me, something that I had need of? Well, when I take the time away from that and I help you to, have what, you know, to get what you have need of, that was God sending me to help you. And so now at the same time, God's going to send someone else to help me. That's how we do it. That's how it works. We, we love one another. Love one another doesn't mean when you love someone, it doesn't just mean you tell them, hi, I love you, or just send them little pictures of roses and a text message or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not love. Love is when somebody has a need and you go out of your way to fulfill that need because you care about their need more than your own. That's charity. That's love. And love never faileth. Charity never faileth. As Paul said, now abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity, because charity never faileth. Praise the Lord. So if we love one another, we're not tearing one another down. We're not calling each other heretic and lunatic and all that stuff. Well, obviously, if someone is a heretic, then we would let them know about that. But, you know, those of us in the body of Christ, we're not plagued by the, the desire to, to, to revile one another and to cut down one another. You see, I don't feel the need to cut you down to make myself look taller. I feel the need to lift you up so that you also can lift me up. And if we both lift one another up, if we both keep lifting one another up, then we're up here. But if we both keep cutting one another down, you know, if I cut you down to make myself look bigger and then you in my own sight, and then you cut me down to make yourself look bigger in your own sight, then we're digging a ditch. We're digging a ditch. And if we dig a ditch for long enough, where are we going to wind up? In hell. Literally. So, we are to love one another with unfeigned love. Unfeigned means not faked, genuine. To feign something, F-E-I-G-N, means to fake it. And lots of people fake it. Harlots fake it. You know, the harlots are the fake churches. They fake it. They fake loving you. You know, when you walk into a church and they're all about hugs and kisses and all, oh, welcome, we love you, welcome to your new family. You know, in two or three months down the road, it's like, you know, Pastor, I can't, uh, I, I lost my job and I, I can't pay my rent. Can you help me? Oh, I'm sorry, we don't have the funding for that. What do you mean you don't have the funding for that? <laughs> what, what happened to all the tithes? All those tithes that I gave all this time. Oh, well, you know, I had to use that for the expenses for the, you know, for the spotlights and the big screen TVs and the microphones and the electric bill and the air conditioning and, and the insurance and the mortgage and all that stuff. Sorry. Next. <laughs> That's how the love of a harlot is. When you, as soon as you stop paying her, she's going to slam the door in your face. But true love, unfeigned love, will tell you, well, yes, of course, I'll help you. If I have it, then you have it. If I have two coats, then one of them is yours. You know, that's what the Lord Jesus said. If you have two coats, impart to him that hath none. You know, why should I be here at my house with two coats when you're outside freezing with no coat? That doesn't make any sense. You should have one. If I have two, you should have one. That's just the way it works when we love. See, when we love, we esteem other better than ourselves. This is what Jesus Christ taught. This is what his apostles taught. This is what God taught from the beginning. That's, a, that's the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the summary of the Ten Commandments of the living God. The first four commandments are about loving God, and the last six commandments are about loving your neighbor. 
And when we will do those things, love is the fulfilling of the law. So if we love our neighbor, and especially if we love the brotherhood, as Peter commanded, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, then when we love, that is the fulfilling of the law. If we're loving somebody, it's guaranteed that we're not going to be breaking the law concerning them, the law of God. We cannot be breaking the law of God while at the same time we are loving somebody, because if we're loving them, there's no law against that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Hallelujah. Being born again, being born again, not of incorruptible seed, but of, inc pardon me, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. I think I need a drink of water, pardon me. Praise the Lord. Being born again. Being, that means that you, that, that Peter is writing to the church, to, the, to Christians, and he's saying you, you are to do these things because you are born again. Being born again, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. And this is what we talked about earlier. If a man is born again, he is born from a seed. Okay, that we were born the first time from a seed, we're born the second time from a seed. The seed is the word of God. It's written in Luke chapter 8, verse 11, very clearly. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. That's what the seed is. If you're born again, then the thing that caused you to be born again is the word of God. The words that God hath spoken, that he has caused his prophets and apostles to write down, and that we have translated into English for us in this book, the Holy Bible, King James Version. This is the word of God. So if we're born again, then we're born of the word of God. That's the seed that caused life to come forth in our womb. And we could see light. Light came forth. And when we decided to obey that light, Jesus described that as receiving the seed into good ground with an honest and a good heart to bring forth fruit. Let's go there. Luke chapter 8. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up, and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, of course, when he cried, it doesn't mean that he wept. It means he cried like he shouted out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Remember, he was speaking to a multitude of people. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. And now he begins to explain. He said, Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So they hear the word, but they don't believe it, and consequently they don't do it, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. 
And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground, that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Keep it. To keep the words of God means to hear, believe, and obey the words of God. That's what it means to keep it. But they on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. With patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, said James, by the Holy Ghost. So the word, pardon me, the seed is the word of God. The word of God, the words that I'm reading for you out of this Holy Bible right now, the words that you have in your Holy Bible that you need to get along with God and read. When you read the word of God, you are at the feet of Jesus Christ. You are in the mount at the bush when you are reading the words that are in this Holy Bible. You are in the presence of God because God was the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, being born again, after he just said all these things that he just said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. The seed that we're talking about, which is the word of God, can never pass away. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The word of God is everlasting and eternal because the word of God is God and God is eternal. The son of God is not eternal, but the word of God which is in him is eternal because the word of God is God and he is the eternal everlasting God. The only one that is eternal is God. There is no one else that is eternal. There is no such thing as an eternal Son of God. There is no such thing as an eternal Son of God. The one who is in the Son of God, which is his God and his Father, my God and my Father, he is eternal. He is the eternal one. That's what his name means, the one which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty who has come in the flesh to save us. And he which was and which is and which is to come was manifest in the flesh. The flesh that he was manifest in is the body of his Son, his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is called Jesus Christ because he inherited his name from his Father. That's why the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Corruptible seed. What is the corruptible seed? The corruptible seed are the teachings of this world, the teachings of the various denominations, the things that we were taught all of our lives as we grew up in a Roman world, whether we went to church or not. That's the corruptible seed. But the incorruptible seed is the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth for ever. The word of God liveth. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is quick and powerful. Quick is a word in English that sometimes can mean really fast, but that's not what it means there in Hebrews 4.12. It means living. And not just living, but able to impart life. That's what quick means. That's what, we, that's what uh, the Bible means sometimes when it says quickened. Quickened means when something uh, was dead and it has been given life quickened. I have been quickened because I was dead and now I'm alive. And if you're a Christian, you have been quickened because you were dead and now you are alive because the gospel is preached unto them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And so if you were dead in sin and now you're not anymore, you've been quickened because the word of God is quick and powerful, quick, not fast in this instance, but living and not just living but living in so much that it is able to impart life. The life is in the word of God. 
the life of God is in his word. The words that have come forth from God's mouth contain life. And if we will receive those words into a good and honest heart and obey God, then we will have the life of God in us. You see, those of us who are Christians, who are Christians, we're not only going to inherit eternal life in the kingdom of God, we already have eternal life inside of us. If you don't have eternal life inside of you now, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You can't inherit the kingdom of God unless you have eternal life in you. And this is why John wrote, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son of God hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Praise the Lord. That's where the life is. The people in Costa Rica say, Pura Vida, pure life. And I always tell them the, the life is in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God isn't alive simply because somebody gave it life. And the word of God isn't just alive for a certain time until it will die. The word of God liveth because it has always been life and it will never cease to be life. <clears throat> there will never come a time <clears throat> pardon me, when the word of God shall pass away. Never. There will never come a time when the word of God shall pass away. Someone, might, If God allowed, someone might be able to take this book out of my hand and throw it in the fire and burn it, if God allowed. But there is no way that the words that are written in this book can ever be burned up. There is no way. Jehoiakim took the scroll that Jeremiah had written. I think it was Jehoiakim. And he cut it with a penknife and threw it in the fire. And it was prophesied of him that he should later on be buried with the burial of an ass. He wouldn't even have a, a decent burial. He wouldn't even be buried with the kings because of such a foolish and rebellious thing that he did. But he, he, Jeremiah just wrote another scroll because Jeremiah had the word inside of him. You see, you can burn up the scroll, but that doesn't mean that you can burn up the word of God. The word of God can't be burned up. Jehoiakim was a fool to think that he could burn the word of God just because he didn't like what it said. But the word of God is spirit and life. It is living and it abideth forever. The word of God which liveth and abideth forever. If you don't like what the word of God says, that's a serious problem that you have between you and God because it's never going to pass away. You will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. So if you don't like what the Word of God says, I counsel you to learn to like what the Word of God says and get used to it. Because if you continue to rebel against what the Word of God says, you will perish and the Word of God will remain forever. See, that's a battle that you can't win if you don't like what the Word of God says. You can't change it with theology. You can change your perception of it and you convince you can convince yourself that it says something that it doesn't say to placate your own self and pretend that it says what you want it to say, but it doesn't say what you want it to say, and it will never say what you want it to say. <laughs> the Word of God is what it is. It says what it says. It is pure, like silver purified in a furnace of earth, tried seven times. It is pure. The Word of God is a shield to them that put their trust in Him. The Word of God is pure forever. It is settled in heaven forever. It says what it says, and you can't change it. So my counsel to you is not even to try but to bow down and receive the truth of the word of God and believe it and do as it is written. Obey God and light shall be sown for the righteous. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. Praise the Lord. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass. And of course, of course, this is a quote from the prophet Isaiah. For all flesh is as grass. All flesh is as grass. And the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. 
God spoke this through the prophet Isaiah to give us an illustration. You are a man, okay, or a woman, and you're probably going to be on this earth for about 70 or 80 years, okay? That's what the scripture says. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, this is what is, is written in the scripture. And that's pretty much the average lifespan of a man from the days, after the days of Noah, you know, from the days of Samuel and onward. Um, that's pretty much the average lifespan of a man, 70 or 80 years. And so God gave us this, this comparison or this parable, if you will, about the grass of the field. How many times have you seen grass be planted and then it withers away and you have to plant more grass the next season? I'm only 56 years old and, and I've seen that lots of times in my life. I can remember if I think about it, grass in, in a house that I lived in when I was four or five years old. Okay, that grass is gone. It's been gone for 50 years. And it's never coming back. It's gone. It was there for a season, and then it dried up. And I remember the dandelions, because I used to live in Minnesota. There, you know, in the grass, there's the dandelions. Um, they're actually weeds, I guess, but I think they look pretty nice. <laughs> so I like them. But anyway, um, and, you know, the, the grass withereth, and the flower of the grass withereth away. And, 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 and that was, you know, the, the grass in one season, at that time when I was four years old, that's gone, and it's never coming back. And that was over 50 years ago. And I'm just a young man. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that was over 50 years ago. So this is why God said this, to cause us to think about the times in the past when we've seen grass be planted and grow up and then wither away. I mean, obviously, if you stand in a field and wait for the for the the grass to wither away, you just stand there watching, and it's like watching paint dry. It's going to seem like a really long time. But if you think back about times that you've seen grass grow, and then how quickly it withered away and was no more, that's why God wanted us to know this. That's why God wanted us to read this. That's why God spoke these words to Isaiah, and Isaiah wrote them down. Not according to any private interpretation of Isaiah, but exactly the way God told him to write it down, by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. All the glory of man. All the glory of man. Think about the most glorious thing that you've ever seen in this life, the most glorious pomp and circumstance that you've ever seen in this life, maybe a parade or or a, a ceremony for a really wealthy person or whatever, or a graduation ceremony or a, an elaborate concert or a, an elaborate fireworks show or whatever. You know, maybe even a, you know, a football game halftime show. You know, not that we're into those things, but we have all, we've all seen stuff like that. And the, all the glory of man is, is as the flower of grass, is as one of those little yellow dandelions, just one of those little yellow dandelions in that grass that grew up and passed away over 50 years ago, and now it's gone. It's been gone for over 50 years. It, it blew away with the wind. And the place thereof shall know it no more, like it's written in Psalm 37. I have seen the wicked, the wicked spreading himself like a green bay tree, yet I sought him and found him no more. I found his place no more. Because he passed away. And he was gone. Man is like the flower of the grass. All the glory of man is like the flower of grass. It's there one season, and then the next season, it's gone. All gone. But the word of our God shall stand forever. For all flesh, listen to this, for all flesh is as grass, and all the flo pardon me, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Do you remember how it's written in the scripture? The outward man perisheth, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The outward man perisheth. This body is getting old. And someday it's going to, you know, my heart will stop and I'll give up the ghost. 
But the inward man is renewed day by day, day by day, changed from glory unto glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. The more I grow day by day and this body gets older, the more I grow on the inside because I'm abiding in Jesus Christ, abiding in his word, continuing in his word. Therefore, I'm his disciple indeed, and I shall know the truth, and the truth shall make me free. And so the more I abide in the word of God, the more I am renewed in the inward man day by day, even though my outward man perish. Because the word that I'm getting in me, the word that I have in me, the word that I was born from, and that I eat and feed on every day, is life everlasting. It liveth and abideth forever. That which I'm getting in me, that's what that which I'm feeding you right now, it liveth and abideth forever. So that which is inside of me is everlasting. And so it doesn't matter that what is on the outside of me is eventually going to fade away. That doesn't matter because what is on the inside of me is life everlasting. Someone might plant an acorn in the ground and feel sad because the acorn isn't going to be an acorn anymore. But if they'll come back in 150 years and look at the towering monster of a tree that has come forth from that acorn, they will marvel and they will say, Wow, how foolish was I to care for that acorn. But when I planted it in the ground, look what came forth. Power and majesty and glory. That is the resurrection. That is the life that we have in us by the word of God. The word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You see, the gospel of Christ isn't just something, a religious doctrine that we memorize. It's the word of the living God. It is spirit and life. And when we will believe it and obey it, then that life will come forth in us and bring forth fruit. And though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day, day by day, changed from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. So that when it comes time to put off this natural man, this natural body, the spiritual body which is inside of me will inherit the kingdom of of the living God because of the, the, the seed from which I have been begotten, which is the incorruptible word of the living God. The word of God from heaven is in me. And if you're my brother or sister, it's in you. And you can rejoice in that because you have the first fruits of the Spirit dwelling in you. You have the earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and the Word of the living God, this Word that I've been sharing with you from the pages of this Holy Bible, this Word which is the incorruptible seed, that which comes forth from this seed can never die. Jesus said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die shall never die. By the grace of God and by the power of the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ, those of us who are in Jesus Christ, we can't die. We cannot be killed. They can take our head off of our bodies and kill our body, but there's no more that they can do. They can't take our life because our life is hid with Christ and God. They can't touch it. There is no weapon formed against us that shall prosper. There is no weapon that any man has ever invented, and even in the depths of the darkness of his, of his depravity, <clears throat> and, 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 and in all the darkness of the psychopaths of this evil world, there is no weapon that they have invented or can invent that can take the life from those of us who are Jesus' sheep. They can't. They might be able to boil us in oil or hang us upside down or cut our heads off or feed us to the, to the pigs or, or you know, drown us in the sea or, or you know, cut our bodies in half or blow us up with dynamite or whatever, but they can't touch our life. 
They cannot kill us. We cannot be killed. Because we have the life in us. And that life is from the Word of God. The living Word of God, which is written on the pages of this Bible. And it's not something that we just need to memorize and we're good to go. It's something that we need to have in us. <clears throat> living and abiding in us. Pardon me. Living and abiding in us. The Pharisees could quote the scripture, but they did not have the word of God abiding in them because they couldn't hear it when it was spoken to them. If you can hear it when it is spoken to you, then you're blessed. And Jesus said, Blessed are your ears, for they hear, and your eyes, for they see. For many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things that ye have seen and hear the things that ye have heard, and they have not heard them nor seen them. You see, this is life. The Word of God is life. That which we're sharing together, even in this letter from Peter, written almost 2,000 years ago, it was written by inspiration of the Spirit of God, and it has been perfectly preserved by God all this time. Many have hazarded their lives and stretched out their necks and given themselves to the sword and to the flames so that you and I could be reading this book right now. Did you know that? And God caused his word to be preserved perfectly and to be translated into the language that you and I are speaking right now or that I'm speaking and that you're hearing me in right now. So that you and I could have this word from God, this word that came from heaven. This is why Jesus said, I am come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. The word of God came down from heaven. The son of God didn't come down from heaven. The word of God came down from heaven. And the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, John said, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He is the image of the invisible God. That's why it says as of the only begotten of the Father. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The glory that the apostles of Jesus Christ saw <clears throat> was the Son of God. They couldn't see the Word of God. You can't see the Word of God. You can hear it if you have ears to hear, but you can't see it. Except you could see it when it was manifested in the Son of God. Then you could see it. Just like John wrote. I'm going to skip over a couple pages to 1 John, right in the beginning. The first four verses. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, how can your hands handle the word of life? How can you see the word of life? Because it was manifest in a man. In a man. They saw him. They touched him. They heard him speak. <clears throat> For the life was manifested and we have seen it. For the life was manifested. Where is the life? Where is the life? The life is in the word. The life is in the Word, the Word of the living God. And he said, John said, he wrote, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have, here's that word again, fellowship, fellowship, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the word came forth. Some of us received it into good ground. Now we have life dwelling in us. And because we have life dwelling in us, if we abide in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin, because we've been baptized in his name, and we're abiding in the light. Let's go back to 1 Peter. And let's read these last four verses again. Verses, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, in closing. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, 
not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It's not just a religious doctrine that we memorize and regurgitate. It is life. To Naaman, it was the healing of his leprosy when he obeyed what the prophet said and dipped himself in the Jordan River seven times. His flesh was clean again. He didn't have leprosy anymore. Because the word of God is life. The word of God is life. And where there is life, how can there be death? In the way of the righteous. Hallelujah. How does it say in Proverbs chapter 12? In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Master. In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. Hearing and obeying the word of God is life. Not hearing the word of God is death. Hearing the word of God and not obeying it is an even greater death. But hearing the word of God and obeying it is life. And when there is life in you, eternal life in you, then you cannot die. Nobody can take your life. Because Jesus Christ, who liveth forever, who is risen from the dead incorruptible, ever liveth to make intercession for you. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. This is not a theological doctrine. It's not something that you just go to school to, to learn, take a few tests, say that you aced it and get a piece of paper that says that you're a whatever, a priest or a teacher or a pastor or whatever. That has nothing to do with this. Nothing at all. This is about Jesus Christ and Him crucified and risen from the dead so that we who believe on him could have life through his name. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Amen.